Hi, everyone. Welcome to week four. The theme for this week is manifestos, as you should have recognized from the three manifestos that we read. And you probably also recognize that this is a pretty sharp break from where we were last week. Uh, going from linguistics and semiology to these manifestos from early avant-garde art movements is a fairly radical change. And on top of that, I threw in the thing about the Super Bowl ads to just kind of mix things up a little bit more. So we've got a lot going on right now, but I think that there are some relationships. And I think that the idea of signs and their meaning will follow us around throughout the semester, even when it sort of slips into the background. So I wanted to just make sure as we set off thinking about these manifestos, before we do that, I just wanted to make sure we've got a clear understanding of the sign signifier signified relationship. I didn't see any questions on the lecture, so I'm assuming that everybody gets this. The concept, the thing we envision in our head is the signified, the sound image that we create is the signifier, and together those are a sign, but a linguistic sign. And then we also have graphic signs. The artists whose work we look at for, for today, for this week, play a lot with those graphic signs. And I think that's a really important aspect of their work. We should also go back and think about real quickly as a review, those, the different forms that those signs can take. They can be pictographic, ideographic, although those two blur to, together a little bit. Remember this idea of the rebus, this kind of reconstruction of dreams. And then we have syllabary and alphabetic representations of the sounds that we create. So I hope everybody gets this. Um, again, you can leave another comment on this week's uh, post if you're still trying to wrap your head around this. And I'll be happy to talk about it one on one. But uh, these are some important concepts. And we'll see that the artists whose, whose writings we've looked at for this week also play with some of these forms of writing and they certainly still employ signs. And I think this is something that we're gonna keep going back to. So I just wanted to quickly touch on that as we lead into the, the ideas for this week. And we'll start with the one that is chronologically first and was the first in the assignment, uh, which is the Futurist Manifesto or the, uh, the Manifesto of the Futurist Group. You see a couple different translations uh, by FT. Marinetti. This is Marinetti looking very regal or militaristic, however you want to look at it. Uh, and he was the founder of the Futurist Group, in addition to being the author of this manifesto. Marinetti was first and foremost a poet. He came from a wealthy Italian family and he trained to become a lawyer before deciding to skip a profession in law and become a, a writer of sorts. He wrote many manifestos, actually. He edited poetry and worked in a couple different sort of, uh, worked in different styles of writing, but was first and foremost an author, a writer. He was deeply influenced by what's, what's known as the concrete poetry movement which was a primarily French movement. And he went to school in, in Paris. So that's sort of part of the influence. In concrete poetry, words become objects. You see certain forms emerge out of the words. That's exactly what Marinetti was doing, at least early on. And this is uh, one of Marinetti's poems. Some of the French poets who did, did this, uh, Guillermo uh, Apollinaire is a very prominent example, would uh, create images of like a horse or a giraffe or something very literal. Marinetti sort of takes this idea of concrete poetry one step further and he creates sort of events, he creates movement, he creates action out of his poems as opposed to just creating objects. So in a way he's kind of breaking from the concrete poetry that came before, but also deeply influenced by 
in any event, it's probably quite unlike any other poetry you've encountered, right? What we're seeing here, we, we think of it as graphic design. We might think about this as page layout, but for Marinetti, this was just the poem, right? It, it may sound kind of strange or radical, but this is how he's thinking about it. The poem has an audible quality to it. It should be read aloud, but the way that it's written is also really important and it's sort of kind of pictographic or ideographic, but the words themselves are in motion. They're moving. They're, they're breaking from the traditional writing style that you're accustomed to encountering whenever you read a poem. There's no lines, um, there, there's no traditional uh, breaks. You can't even talk about uh, pentameter or, or anything like that because you don't even know where to start reading on the page. This is the cover of a book of poems that look just like that, and it's called Zeng Tum Tum. This is a story about a, a battle that the Italian army was involved in, and it's one of Marinetti's better known works. You would flip through and every page looks about like this with words all over the page. Sometimes there's actually also music notes, and uh, if you hear a good reading of it, there will be singing happening, uh, and, and, and uh, much of this is meant to sort of create the idea of onomatopoeia that we encountered last week. So we see tum, tum, tum. It's intended to be the sound of a cannon, of guns firing in a war. I'll include a link to uh, a reading of this on the post because it's really fascinating. Even if you don't understand a single word of the Italian language in which it's written, you can get a lot from hearing this poem read aloud and you can understand a little bit about what Marinetti is, is interested in and where his poem is going. Or another example of one of Marinetti's poems. And again, let me emphasize that these are all poems. This is not graphic design. This is not page layout. This is not meant to be a composition in, in a sort of purely graphic sense. This is a poem that's meant to be read. Surely there's going to be different interpretations with every reader, but this is the approach that Marinetti's taking. Now, it's prefiguring some, some ideas about page layout and, and some of the approaches that graphic designers will use in the years and decades that follow, but that's not how Marinetti's thinking about it. He's thinking about this as a poem. It's also worth noting that in printing this poem, there's a requirement to go outside of traditional printing processes. In 1919, in, in the 1910s, when Marinetti was very actively writing these poems, most printed works were still set and printed on a letterpress, where you have a frame in which you create lines of type. And the actual structure of the printing process requires that everything be in a grid. You cannot print this poem on a letterpress. You have to use newer technologies like the lithograph that were starting to become prominent in the printing industry. So it's noteworthy that this poem is also representative of technological advances. We might not recognize it at first. It doesn't seem like a shiny new car, which Marinetti also talks about, but in a way, this poem is actually representative of and completely dependent on the printing technologies that were emerging and becoming widespread at the time. So even in his sort of composition, Marinetti is, uh, is thinking deeply about new technology. And you should have recognized that that's really the dominant theme in the Futurist Manifesto. What we're looking at here, or at least in part of the page, is the Futurist Manifesto. This is the front page of Le Figaro. It's a French newspaper. And if you look all the way over on the left-hand side, um, I hope it doesn't get flipped, right? It's, uh, I'm looking at the left-hand side. Um, and you'll see Le Futurisme, right? This is actually the front page of the newspaper is where the Futurist Manifesto first appeared. 
right? Which is, you know, pretty radical to think, um, you know, open the, the New York Times, whether it's the print copy or, or uh, you know, the homepage of the website or, or, you know, grab today's New York Post. And you're probably not going to see many manifestos from avant-garde art groups on the front page, right? It was a little bit more common in 1909 that you might see this. Um, so Marinetti is is composing uh, the, these ideas, and and they're they're radical. They're really um, they take up a, a really central place in the culture of the time. And the Futurist Manifesto was absolutely debated and debated uh, vigorously at the time in which it was published. I think most of us recognized that there are some uh, fairly radical, fairly extreme ideas in that uh, manifesto, right? I want to get into them, but I also want to show you some examples of some futurist work, some of which you may be familiar with, but I think it's important to sort of frame the, the goals of these artists and to look at uh, the work that was created in conjunction with this manifesto. One of the best known works by Giacomo Bala is called Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash, which is actually just the sort of uh, English translation. And one of the striking things about this image, which you may be familiar with from, from art history and so on, um, is the movement and the way that the movement's represented. We don't ever see movement this way with our naked eye. We see movement like this as recorded by a camera, right? This is movement that is representative of photographic and cinematic technology. So even though this is a simple scene of a woman walking a dog, the fact that the motion is pictured in the way that it is, not only shows the sort of speed of, of culture and society passing in front of us, but it also shows us some of the technology that we use in, in, that, in the society that, uh, that recognizes the speed. Another noteworthy futurist work by Umberto Boccioni is called Synthesis of Human Dynamism. One of the notions here, and you might have recognized this in the manifesto, is that the speed we acquire in modern society, the, the things that are set in motion, have a fundamental metaphysical, deeply philosophical, impact on our lives. Human beings are transformed by the technologies that we access. It's not just about sort of getting from point A to point B a little bit quicker. It's about a real fundamental change in how we understand and interact with the world. Boccioni, like the other futurists, was imagining a human being transformed by the new technology that became available, a, a, a new human being that would move faster, that would be fragmented, that would break away from the traditional norms of, of human behavior and reinvent themselves. And this was opposed to the winged victory of Samothrace, right? And, and this is, also mentioned in the manifesto, right? Uh, this was considered by many to be the most beautiful object of antiquity and, and still is uh, considered by many to, to be that. It is, uh, you can go see it uh, if you ever go to the Louvre in Paris, it is on view and it is quite an extraordinary sculpture. Uh, so the idea that we would smash this to bits and replace it with the new human is sort of central to this manifesto and is probably, I think, a, a, a few people mentioned in their responses that like, maybe we shouldn't completely do away with all of the old art. Maybe there's a certain quality to it that should be revered. And even the futurists say, well, you should go once a year and look at these things and then go out and discover the new world. Um, but it's interesting to me that there's a sort of almost uh, aesthetic or visual similarity between uh, the work that the futurists are making sculpturally and these ancient works that they're also 
uh, saying we should maybe destroy or, or disregard. They, they still seem to be very interested in these works. Or in another work by Umberto Boccioni, uh, the humanism, the human dynamism of a cyclist. Uh, so this is a painting. And once again, we see this motion, we see this fragmentation of the human body. This is representative of what, not a direct representation, but this is well in line with what we see in the introductory paragraphs of this manifesto. You may have sort of been confused by those. They might have made your head spin a little bit. If so, good. That means you were paying attention. They have that effect on you as you read them. They're a little bit disorienting. And it's important to note this. The imagery is surreal. It's, it's something that is imagined, that's very hyperbolic. If you found yourself feeling like you were kind of lost in a dream, then that's exactly the sort of effect that it's supposed to have. There's, there is some logic to it. Marinetti combines some very ancient sort of mythological type imagery. Right, he's talking about sea serpents, which is almost a sort of a biblical kind of image. Um, he he talks in, I think, in a, a way that should probably uh, offend us. Um, he talks about his Sudanese nurse, and we should recognize all the um, the, the racial and, and classist dimensions to that statement. Um, but he's also sort of talking about this return to the maternal womb, this attachment to uh, the earth, to, to physical nature in the problematic way that he talks about it. So we move through this almost sort of fever dream of, of an experience, of a night that the, the futurists supposedly encountered. It's all fictional. It's something that's completely invented. Um, they did get around, they did sort of get together and sit around in, in these groups having debates and um, hopping in their cars and driving around. And, you know, there's some basis in reality, but it's creating this sort of vision of the world in which they're living and the world from which this manifesto emerges. And th that introductory uh, piece brings us to uh, the bullet points of the manifesto. And we'll go back to a picture of Marinetti to cover these points, because I think they actually are very well um, wrapped up with the person that Marinetti was. As we go through these, you probably find yourself going along with them and sort of on board with Marinetti's ideas as, as we set out. You know, the love of danger sounds, sounds fun, right? It sounds like a, an exciting time. And then we start talking about courage, audacity, revolt. These also seem like sort of good things, right? It sounds exciting, time for a new movement, time to break from, from the old and to find the beauty of speed. We sing of the man at the wheel driving the car, which might not even sort of strike us that it, maybe it should say men and women at the wheel. And then we pass through a couple of, of it, get, it gets sort of um, a little more aggressive. We, we find that poetry should be a violent assault. And we probably start to say that maybe there's other kinds of poetry as well. Maybe poetry shouldn't always be violent. And then I think most readers today, we get to the ninth uh, point in the manifesto, the ninth bullet, um, where we say, first we say we want to glorify war, which seems problematic to most of us today, I think. Um, even, you know, even if people are sort of involved in war, we don't normally think about glorifying it. And then that same, uh, that, that same bullet point in the manifest of the ninth point um, ends with this idea about contempt for women, which really does not square with our ideas today. And you should recognize that that's a deeply problematic point in this manifesto. It's misogynistic by all accounts. Uh, it's from the culture that invented the word machismo. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some logic behind it, but I personally find it to be something of an inexcusable 
piece of this manifesto. I think that it's problematic and I, I'm not sure if there's a way to escape how problematic that is. It's there. And it's also connected to Marinetti's deeper views. You may have noticed in this image that Marinetti is in a soldier's uniform. World War I had not broken out when this manifesto was written, but when it did a few years later, Marinetti quickly signed up and fought for the Italian army. He continued to be a patriot for, for Italy uh, throughout his life. And as an, as an older man, he actually re-enlisted. He was in his late 50s and he re-enlisted when World War II broke out. And true to his idea of glorifying war, he went back to war, he was on the front lines and he was killed in World War II. So he lived this as he said it. And if you know about the history of World War I and II and of Italy in the first half of the 20th century, you should know that the dominant ruling party was the fascists. F.T. Marinetti was a fascist and the Futurist Manifesto was written by a fascist. And what's more, Marinetti actually wrote a manifesto for the fascist party. He, he again, I said he, he wrote a few of them and one of them was a, a fascist manifesto, which he wrote in 1919. What's funny is that there's actually some very progressive or at least what we would call progressive views in the fascist manifesto. Um, he's talking about a reduction to an eight hour workday, which didn't exist in most of Europe at that time, a minimum wage, which also didn't exist. Voting rights for women is actually a piece of the fascist manifesto. So on one hand, he has contempt, maybe his views changed, maybe um, it's just sort of advantageous to the party. Uh, earlier retirement, ages from 65 to 55. There's actually some really good things in this manifesto, but uh, it also calls for increased armaments, uh, a sort of a stronger, uh, a, a, a stronger militarization of the country, the seizure of all possessions of religious congregations, so the complete eradication of religion. There's some problems and we should recognize that the fascist movement, fascist parties, and the resurgence of fascist parties today are deeply problematic. And in my mind, Marinetti's work, his writings are, can be seen as problematic in that way. And I'm not sure if there's really a, a way to fully separate his ideas from his politics. Again, it's a point for debate, but we should notice that there's some intertwinement here that, that's occurring. And then we'll, we'll note, just going back quickly, the end of this manifesto goes back to the idea of the museums and to do away with all of uh, the past. It's a really interesting, complicated point. Futurism is about always looking forward, but we must question what role does the past play? Should we really take this at face value, or should we say maybe it's good to stop and contemplate the past at some point? So that's a, a few of the questions uh, that we should consider. Moving on, we can see that across the continent and actually moving uh, towards Eastern Europe around the same time, well, the fascists are in power in Italy, there's a whole new movement happening in, in, in Russia in what's going to become the Soviet Union. And this was the movement towards communism, uh, notably the 1917 revolution completely changed the fabric of Russian society and gave rise to a whole slew of new art movements and a whole new uh, set of ways of looking at the world new avant-garde art movements that may share some things in common with futurism, but are also very different. One of the notable works from this time, which again, you may have encountered in art history is Vladimir Totlin's Monument to the Third International. This was to be a great public monument like the Eiffel Tower. 
um, that could be used as a, a as a radio station, as a mixed public use space. It was uh, radical utopian architecture. Meanwhile, the suprematist group, who I mentioned uh, when, when we looked at avant-garde art movements, were deconstructing images and creating a new sort of art that would communicate ideas about the new society. So Malevich is uh, painting things like the black square, which are laden with meaning, and then creating exhibitions that look like this, where we have this whole sort of arrangement of, of images that convey ideas about the new society. Malevich is still thinking about an art gallery and still thinking about painting in this context. Um, and again, I showed you the, uh, the suprematist composition, the white on white squares. So although still locked in the traditional forms of art making, this form of thinking gives way to the new movements that will follow. And notably moving on to our next manifesto, the constructivist movement. At the core of this movement are Alexander Rodchenko, Varvara Stepanova, and Alexei Gon. Alexei Gon is important, but has historically not remained as important as Rodchenko or Varvara Stepanova. And we actually encounter this, um, I, part of this is the problem with the way that I presented it as a manifesto by Rodchenko, but it's really by Rodchenko, Varvara Stepanova, and Alexei Gon. Rodchenko has sort of been the most prominent in art history, but there's actually a very nice uh, sort of rediscovery of Varvara Stepanova's work in recent years, and, and more on that in a second. Both Alexander Rodchenko and Varvara Stepanova were from working class or peasant families, and they came together and met in, in an art school, which was sort of a almost kind of like a technical school for artisans. Neither one were from wealthy families um, and neither one had very much exposure to art before going to art school. They, were, they sort of um, came in with this sort of technical understanding, but in art school, they encountered the work of Malevich and of Totlin and the other avant-garde artists at the time. And they recognized that art could be part of the new society and then began setting out to, to create work that would do that. You may have seen some of Rachenko's early works, which are also paintings. He's building from uh, the, the same concepts as Malevich and breaks from representation though. You don't see Rachenko painting naturalistic scenes. We don't see his figure drawing class work, right? We see these sort of, we, we see this deconstruction of, of what an image could be. And we, we see, an emergence of forms. Uh, uh, it, they almost look like engineering, like technical drawings instead of traditional uh, painting and drawing as you might expect it. Rochenko also starts to think, as it says in, in, the, in the manifesto, more like an engineer, starts thinking about ways that art can be constructed, not just sort of uh, painted or sculpted. So we see sculptures like this one called a spatial construction that not only enter into abstraction, not only break from traditional representation, but also create something that's very economical. This simple to make object that could be easily reproduced and kept in the homes of many, many people and can also be flattened, could be shipped to somebody uh, for an inexpensive price because it can be sort of set in a flat box and sent off, it can be made very compact. We should note that there's a huge influence on industrial design that, that comes from this type of thinking. And it's a really sort of radical break from sculpture that came before. We also see Rodchenko working in numerous fields. He, he goes from, from painting to sort of graphic print-based illustration works, which I'll show you in a second, to sculpture, to photography, and so on. Um, and he's, he's highly regarded as a, as a photographer as well. We can see a couple compositions. But at the core of this was an idea that the new construction, 
arts, the new form of art making that would do away with all previous forms of art making, or at least sort of push them to the museums, the artist would be a constructor. And these constructions would not just be decorative, they wouldn't just hang on your wall, they would change society, they would change the very fabric of your life. And we would sort of build our new society based on this new form of construction. One of the ways that Rodchenko and also Varvara Stepanova embraced this idea was also, you know, in addition to sculptures and, and images, they also constructed clothing. And we see Rodchenko here modeling his, his worker's uniform that he created together with Varvara Stepanova. And the idea was that the artist of the future needed new clothes to be that artist. So we make the clothes as well. And of course, Rodchenko also combines all of the media that he's working with using photographic type imagery. We see that the images here are based on photos, but if we look closely, they're drawings from photos. And then we mix, we combine those with geometric abstraction and then typography. And we come up with this movie poster that was completely new at the time. There wasn't really a name for this when Rodchenko was doing this, but of course we now recognize that this is graphic design. I played off of this on the opening slide, but this, this poster is obviously one of the most sort of famous works of graphic design ever. We should recognize that Rodchenko and the constructivists really invented what we now call graphic design. It didn't quite, there were posters and there were images, but this interplay of image, photograph, illustration, text, and printed materials becomes graphic design. It was a concept that didn't quite exist and became a reality with the constructive. Meanwhile, Varvara Stepanova is doing very interesting things with other kinds of design. And again, needing to sort of not just communicate in new ways for the new society, but also thinking about the kind of uh, the practical everyday things. Remember, I think one of the great points in this manifesto, they say we are the beginning, our work is today, a mug, a floor brush, boots, a catalog, and so on. We're not here to build new Penn stations. We're not here to build uh, iron bridges, zeppelins. Uh, we're here to uh, cre recreate the fabric of everyday life, those brooms, boots, and so on. And this is largely what Stepanova was doing. And interestingly, maybe why she wasn't quite as highly regarded in an art historical sense, she was doing things like creating uniforms. Um, this is the unisex sport clothes that, that uh, she designed and created as part of this constructivist mission, right? And actually, if you look at the, on the homepage of our website, that graphic at the top is a, is a fabric pattern designed by Varvara Stepanova. And she created many of those. They're, they're really fascinating. They're very fun to look at. But this was part and parcel of the new art, the new society, that would come from constructing the world. And here's another display of, of the unisex sport clothes. It's sort of odd, you see they're called unisex sport clothes, but all of the images of these clothes show women wearing the clothes. So it's kind of, whether it achieved that or not is questionable, but that's what Stepanova was, was aiming for. And one more where we see these, these clothes at work. As we read the manifesto, we see some of these lines, we see that technology is the mortal enemy of art. And artists are not dreamers who build, from, who build uh, radio stations, elevators, and cities. They're building something more simple. So there's a funny relationship to technology, right? It's surely not the wholehearted embrace that Marinetti is calling for but it also is present. It also is somehow being used to create a society that will benefit everyone.
And again, we should recognize that the Russian Revolution was a communist revolution. So um, there's a very different approach between the fascists and the communists, right? And there's this a utopic vision. As much as we can sort of critique the direction that that took, and as much as communism became corrupted in later years in, in Russian society, at this point, in the 1910s, in the 1920s, it's a moment of great optimism. And there's this dream that there can be a society in which everyone is equal, in which everyone has access to the same resources. There will be no rich or poor. Everyone can sort of be on the same footing. And art can do that. Design can do that. We can come together. We can live better through having all of the right information shared with everyone and having the uniforms in which to sort of uh, behave in the way that we should. So it's a really quite uh, beautiful utopic vision if you choose to embrace it. Elizitsky is thinking along these, along similar lines, but not quite in the same way. Elizitsky was actually born to a wealthy Jewish family around the same time and he was, he was very accomplished as an artist and an architecture very early in life. He applied to the, the art school in St. Petersburg in Russia, was, did, did exceedingly well on his exams to get in, but was then denied entry because of his Jewish background, which is problematic on many levels. And we should recognize the closed-mindedness of the society that didn't allow him to, to enter into the school. But the good that came out of it was he, he then traveled Europe and was educated uh, in France and Germany and traveled all over the place and got to see other avant-garde art movements firsthand, had contact with uh, people who would go on to form the Bauhaus, uh, really got to see the culture that was happening in Western Europe and brought that back to Russia and really sort of reinvented Russian art and culture because of that. You're probably most familiar with this work from Elizitsky, and you've prob you probably saw this in an art history class. If I could ask you right now what it's about, you would, you would scratch your head and say, I know it's something about the Communist Party, and it's something about the revolution, and how they're fighting against one another, and that would all be correct. To properly understand this work, to properly contextualize it, I think we need to look at some other imagery that would have circulated at the time. Most notably, here is a propaganda poster that a Russian peasant or worker might have seen on the streets of Moscow or St. Petersburg around the same time. The title of this work is The Fight of the Red Knight with the Dark Force. We see the Red Knight is a communist. He's dressed like a worker. He's holding a shield that has the hammer and sickle on it. He's not wielding a sword. He's not wielding a specialized weapon for battle. It's a hammer, probably the same hammer that he uses in his shop to, to you know, hammer out metal for his occupation. He's fighting the, the black and the white knight. The black knight is representative of the military at the time, and the white knight is representative of the aristocracy. These are all symbols that every Russian peasant would have understood, and we have a very clear battle happening right here. If you're accustomed to seeing this type of image, and then you see an image like beat the whites with the red wedge, and then you see this kind of black fortress uh, built around the whites, the imagery is very clear, right? So it sends the same message, but in a simplified way. And I think this should, we should go back and think about last week when we see this image, right? We should recognize that we have something pictographic, we have something ideographic, we have a graphic representation that has an extremely powerful communicative uh, capacity built into it. It may not be syllabic. It may not sort of spell out exactly what we should read. And the relationship between signifier, sign, 
signifier signified in signs may be a little hazy, but nonetheless, the viewer at the time would, would surely recognize what this image was about and would surely sort of interpret it on a, on a communicative level. So the, it may not be linguistic, but it is certainly semiological, right? And Lazitsky tried to do this with all of his work. He actually abandoned the, he continued to paint on, on canvas or on wood, but instead of calling them paintings, he called them crowns. And he would continually sort of reduce images to these geometric qualities. Also moving towards um, the interplay of illustrative objects, geometric patterns, and typography, working towards what we would call design. You may have also seen images of this work, which is called Of Two Squares. I'm gonna go through a few of them. If you've seen them, great, this is a great refresher, but I think they're very representative of what Lizitsky's talking about in this manifesto. He begins by talking about invention, that all art is invention, and there's a technical aspect to it and, art, and an artistic aspect to it. He also talks about dematerialization. This is something that happens technologically. Um, books can become smaller, lighter. This is just a little saddle stitched booklet. It's not a big, heavy Gutenberg Bible, right? So it's dematerialized. And the process of printing uh, as you work on a smaller scale is also dematerialized. You use smaller presses and you can create these very quickly and easily. He also talks about this idea of plastic representation. The idea is that we move from verbal representation and we move towards these images. And the idea is that this will become a national, that we can have a form of representation that can be understood across time and space that will no longer be dependent on the written language. Whether or not that really comes to be is a good question, but we, it certainly is interesting to ask, what would this look like today? Is it still possible? Could a book do it? Or is it something that no longer happens? Is the a national communication something that will happen outside of a book? Lizitsky likens it to an airplane, but we also have to think about all the smaller technologies which we, with which we communicate today. Maybe it's not an airplane, but a smartphone. Lizitsky also had this idea that the spread of information, the spread of the book could educate the masses. Is this what design does today? Has, has the multi-sensorial vision that he talks about? Remember at one point he thinks about the book that moves beyond just vision where you, it creates sound, maybe taste, smell. Has this multi-sensorial vision of a book taken any form today? Do we have a sort of new book that we encounter with not just our eyes, but with our ears, our nose, and our mouth, maybe our sense of touch? It's possible. There's maybe some forms, maybe it's not quite a book. Lizitsky also talks about this perpetual sharpening of the optic nerves, meaning we'll see better. Our, our, our sort of understanding of, of images will be improved. I think this is true. I think that this has happened. I think we're, we're very keen in our sense of vision and we re rely on it probably more heavily than somebody in the early 20th century might have. Lazinski thinks it's going to happen with cinema and magazines. And maybe he was right, but that's probably not so true anymore. So what is the form that that takes now? How do we process the world today? What are the devices or the technologies that facilitate that? Lizitsky also talks about a new plastic language, which goes back to that sort of form of representation. It's not about a written, it's not about transcribing any one language. It's about creating a set of images that will represent the world. Does that exist? What form does that take? What does it look like in our world today? These are all questions that can come up from reading these manifestos. And, and I hope it gives you something to think about because, and one, one more image from Lizitsky, 
and then I'm going to go to the, the blank screen. I won't leave the window because it's too, too much of a hassle. But the discussion for this week, the place where we'll go with this, um, I'm going to share the link to a contemporary manifesto of sorts. It's a piece written by uh, a UX UI designer named Mike Montero. And I think he lays out a vision for what design should be today, or at least a partial vision. And my question to you and the discussion point is, what are the point, what, what does the manifesto for a designer today look like? How has it changed since the 1910s or the 1920s? What declarations should we make about the future of design? And the thing that you'll do for the discussion is to write out a few bullet points for the for the manifesto. I hope glorification of war and contempt for women are not on yours, but I do want to see an honest depiction of where you think design should go. So the idea is going to be to write out a few more new bullet points for the design of the future and then look at everyone else's and maybe we can sort of put together a group manifesto based on that. Looking forward to what you, to what you have to share and looking forward to your work for this week. Thanks.